Good morning, good afternoon, and good day wherever you may be joining us from. Welcome to another edition of Sales TV Live. Today, we're discussing the unique challenges of founder-led sales. We're joined by Kayvon Toran. Kayvon is the CEO and co-founder of Zal AI and has extensive background in launching and building startups. Kayvon, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Excited <laughs> to have you. Let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about you, your background, and what led you to where you are today. Sure, yeah. So I've spent my entire career working in early stage technology startups, and I've worn essentially every hat that you can. Uh, and um, yeah, for the last five of those years, uh, five plus years, I worked at an ed tech incubator called Noodle, where I joined as a product manager. I got sprinkled around the portfolio doing product management at different companies, solving different problems within K through 12 uh, and post-secondary. And uh, eventually that culminated in me uh, launching uh, and co-creating a product with the C CEO of Noodle. Um, and uh, yeah, I had a great experience doing that, and uh, but it also sort of gave me this insight into the industry when it came to corporate learning and workforce development, which is that a a lot of workforce development isn't isn't so great um, from the perspective of the learner, but that b a lot of the companies that go to universities looking for very expensive corporate development uh, don't actually know what they need, and they definitely don't know how to measure the efficacy of the product they're buying, the training, and so. Those insights were what sort of led me to uh, sort of see this big opportunity to combine generative AI, learning science, and workforce development, and to found Zal with my co-founder. So that's sort of how I got here. All right. So can you share your experience with founder-led sales? I mean, what's it look like when you get it right? And what are the implications when you don't? Yeah. And in fact, we can go even a step back. I can share my experience just doing sales first and foremost. So sure. early on in my career, I started off as an account executive. Um, as I think even before that, I was doing like more BDR type work. And, um, you know, I found some early success doing that line of work. I really was attracted to the kind of work. I liked the sort of challenge of building a system, feeling sort of the push and pull of something working or not working, looking for sort of the subtle cues. I really fed into sort of the art and science element of what I think is like, you know, trite, but like fundamental to doing sales. And it's funny because in starting Zal, I thought, oh, you know, I'll call upon that experience, no problem. And, you know, I'll, I'll help the company make its first initial sales and we'll be off and running. This is going to be great. And, um, you know, it's like that Mike Tyson quote, right? Like everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face kind of thing. So I still, I slowly started to remember that this wasn't so easy, um, especially at the beginning when you don't have sort of the brand and all the work that, you know, the fine folks in marketing are doing to really establish the credibility of the organization, the product for you as a salesperson to just essentially piggyback off of and be an expression of, right? Um, and so doing all of those things at once to get a founder led sales motion off the ground uh, humbled me a bit and is still humbling me. Um, but I think uh, I, I'm finding a lot of joy in starting up that process. So I want to I want to pause there and go back to you, Rob, so I can make sure I'm answering specific your question. But I want to lay down that as the foundation for sort of where we're at. Absolutely. I'm just trying to figure out really the the skills that founders should develop to be effective in the the sales role and then i'll have a follow-up from that yeah well i think for specifically the sales function and i you know i think it's hard as an early stage founder not to think of it as one jumbled mess of go-to market but i think isolating just the sales function I think the most important thing, again, I, I just feel like I'm going to say a bunch of stuff that people have heard before, so ex apologies, but is really your ability to listen and be empathetic in a conversation. Um, as the individual in charge of founder-led sales, 
you're just as much responsible for making the sale as you are for developing the requirements of the product. And so, in fact, I'd say the latter is worth more than the former at the beginning. And so I think that's something that's really challenging as a founder if you're not able to identify that and hone in on that skill. Um, yeah, that's probably the most important one. So you had touched on something and said, yeah, well, it's kind of tried. Everyone knows this and whatever, but that was really my follow on question is what about those founders that have never been in a sales role before? What are those basics that they need to know that, yes, those of us that have been in sales, we know them so much that uh, they, they almost seem silly to bring up. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So, so. Look, I mean, there's like some fundamentals in terms of how you should be operating as like a salesperson from like a skill basis. And, and to me, a lot of these things are very tactical. Like you need to be incredibly punctual. You need to follow through on the things that you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to fo follow up with someone at a certain time, if you say you're going to follow up with materials, you need to be able to do that on time consistently. You need to rep you need to understand that the way you conduct yourself is an expression of how that person is then interpreting your ability to actually perform the work, no matter how smart and competent you are in that line of work. Their ability to trust you when you're starting at a place of probably zero credibility is gonna be based on all of these small micro interactions. And so like fundamentals of like professionalism and like good communication, I think are like really, really paramount. I think those are some of like the like core things, but then, yeah, I mean, we're getting into it a little bit, but I cannot stress how important it is to take a breath, like not think that the way sales works is Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. And like, th this is not about like slam dunking someone to yes. <laughs> it's like, it's quite the opposite, especially at the beginning of like, you really need to demonstrate empathy. You really need to demonstrate a level of humility like that balance of like, yes, I'm knowledgeable, I'm smart, I've done my homework, but I recognize the 20% nuance that you're about to provide to me in this conversation is going to be critical in me actually being able to solve a meaningful problem for you, which is how we are going to actually engage in a sales narrative together, right, fundamentally. So, um, yeah. I think like tactically, it's that stuff that I mentioned in the beginning and more strategically as like a theme, it's like, it's 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 empathy and stuff. So, you, you have me at Glen Gary Glen Ross. <laughs> oh, you lost me at Glen Gary Glen Ross. No, but but, <laughs> but, but but I think jokingly, particularly for people that aren't in sales, that's what sales is, isn't it? And yeah. you know, often if you're coming to sales anew, uh, the challenge that that you have is that you you don't see it as a skill set. You know, yeah. so. Certainly, I know I have been in environments where uh, the the founders of the business and or the the more technical people within the business, you know, they've been to university to understand computer science or whatever it is that they're doing or design or whatever the discipline is. And that's a very formal education process. And there are loads of proof points that they've absorbed and are able to to repurpose that education to, to solve specific problems. And then uh, you cave on, well, you, you've just got to go and sell it, okay? Just chat to a few people and get them to buy it. And actually, it's, it, I can't help thinking that, that there's, a, there's a huge education process in here for people that are coming from a technical background to understand that the interpersonal bit, the selling bit, the problem solving bit, the, the actual commerce part of it is not only equally and in some cases more complex than the technical part of it, but it's also more important you know, you can have the best product in the world, but if nobody buys it, you have nothing. Yeah, exactly. And 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 another thing I'll add to that that I think a lot of new founders miss, myself in the same bucket. But one, but maybe these are like my instincts around some of these things are a little bit different because I've had a background in sales. Is that I think there's a obsession with iterating on the product, and you hear a lot of people talk about that's like you know fundamental to a startup. What you hear less about is how are we iterating on the go to market motion? And, and to your point, Adam, I'd argue that's more important, especially mm. in B2B SaaS, because you like 
you know, and you and you hear a lot of pundits talking about this now too, is like build the audience and then build a product or service and sell that to them. Like they actually go backwards on that motion. And that's, you know, you see a lot of people talking about that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, regardless of if you do that or not, like uh, I think you're right that a lot of um, like first time founders are surprised at how much of a process, is, how, how involved it is and how much is in, is involved in actually creating uh, like not just a sales motion that works with just the founder, right? But then, you know, and I know that's where we're focusing, but then thinking about then how you take that to the next level of hiring someone off the shelf and getting them to take that on. I, I, I think, I don't know if we should even touch that for this conversation because it's like a whole <laughs> other thing. But. Isn't, isn't there a, a whole thing about um, founders often needing a cold shower, you know, a dose of reality around this stuff. Because, you know, if you've got product A, product B and product C that are fit for purpose. So let's say, let, let, let's say you've got Oracle, you've got Salesforce, you've got SAP. Uh, they're different products, although they operate in the same space. Uh, they offer different features and functions in some instances. But actually, it makes zero difference which one you go for, because there are massively successful companies that use SAP and massively successful companies that use Salesforce and massively successful companies that use Oracle. And I think that further to your point about this iterating of the product, you know, I've had a really great idea. We can inf install this feature or we can put this connector in or we can have it talking to this. Thing. And actually, none of that makes any difference, really. And not in the long run, because all of these things are perfectly fit for purpose. And I think we obsess about trying to have a better product rather than having a better story about the product. And mm. and I think that founders are often looking to solve a problem that isn't there. Because we all of us kind of begin thinking about this from the basis of, well, if, if I'm better, you know, whether that's me as an individual or the product, if I'm better, I'll be more successful. That's nonsense, utter nonsense, you know. VHS and Betamax, the best example of, of an inferior product winning. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, this happens time and again, and it's all about building the relationships, getting the toehold, understanding how you can tell a story that people that are actually buying it can understand and, most importantly, empathize with. Yeah, no, it's really well said. I, you know, and I think part of it, too, is is for founders also to be realistic with the industry that they're in and the nature of their product. So especially if you're talking about like, if we're talking about just like straight up B2B SaaS, like let's be honest with each other that there's very, there are very few technological moats left in terms of your ability to build a SaaS product that no one else can't just copy in terms of features. I'd say amplified by generative AI and AI co-pilot, you know, software development you know, capability. Um, I know a lot of founders aspire to having network effects. And this is like one of my favorite lines. I, and I don't know if you guys have caught this a lot. Like you'll go through like a big pitch about a startup and it's like, well, like what's the moat to your business? And it's like, well, all the data that we're collecting will allow us so that at the point that we have, let's say 10,000 users that we'll have the data that allows us to then build better recommendation models and XYZ. And we have this private data set. And so then we just win and we keep winning. It's like, yeah, a bad strategy is I'll win because I've already won. Like, how do you, <laughs> how are you winning day one? And what is the mo day one for someone to actually use you so that you can get to the point where you have 10,000? Because once you have 10,000, it's easy to obviously build off of your private data set or whatever to build that product oriented mode. And I think to your point, like the day one thing that you can do right away, you can start building thought leadership, you can start building a brand, you can get experts to actually talk about your company, and how you're positioned to be, you know, so like on the cutting edge of the thing you, you can get, like, there's so many more tangible ways to build a moat around your business as a founder. Um, that has nothing to actually do with the product at the beginning. But I think it's, you need to also understand how you're marrying that with the long-term vision of then the roadmap of then how it folds into the product and how it all sort of gels together. Um, but I, but I agree with you that at the beginning, I think it's really, it, it, it 
it's mostly the case that it's not going to come from the product. So, but but equally, I think it's very easy to underplay the importance of the founders in those early days, isn't it? You know, you're the founder of your business, and you consequently are not only the the visionary and the the kind of uh, the driving force behind it. You're also the figurehead of the business, mm -hmm. and. And I think that that you know there, there's something. If you were thinking of of running an ad campaign, heaven forbid. But if you were thinking of running an ad pay, ad campaign on Facebook, and Mark Zuckerberg turned up to your pitch, you'd be immeasurably more likely to purchase that as a result of him being on the pitch. Yeah. And I think that that one of the challenges is that that founders are often distracted from the fundamental tasks within an organization and fail to recognize that actually they are often the secret source. Hmm. I love that. I, I mean, I'm just curious, what do you think those some of those fundamental tasks are? Well, the, 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 the most fundamental of them is selling stuff. Yeah, you know, because without that, you have no revenue, you can't hire people, you can't pay yourselves, you can't develop the product, you can't satisfy the customer need. So the, the most important thing is to sell stuff. And and those fundamental tasks, uh, and you know, Mark Zuckerberg be a good example of this because he he still does some coding on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, because he wants to keep his hand in and he wants to 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 have some ownership of that rather than just owning shares within the organisation. And I think that that you know your ability to c tell a compelling narrative is much greater than mine because it's your business, not mine. Yeah. And you know, I work and and a, you know another great example, Gary V. You know, he stands up and, and, and you you know, he oozes passion for what it is he does from every pore. And he says, you know, you, 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 your employees are never going to work as hard as you because it's your dream, not theirs. Yep. And we think that often we lose sight of this, don't we? We think, oh, well, this will be great. You know, I'll found the business. We'll start to get some sales in. Then I can hire loads of people to do that. Actually, that, no, that's the the best people. And, and I think that, that this is one of the keys of having a like a flat hierarchy within an organization we're, we often see the management as being the objective you know this is the glamorous job i'm going to manage everybody i'm going to manage the business i'm going to be managing director of the business actually if you're the best salesperson you should be the salesperson not yeah. even the sales manager you should be the salesperson if you own the business and you're the salesperson because you're the best person at selling that you work within a meritocracy don't you and you're you're providing the maximum value into the organization you possibly can no, I love that. I mean, I think I can't agree with that more. It is definitely something that I've noticed is, I think also, again, confusing to a lot of, and, and now I'm, I can speak more specifically to like tech founders. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a misunderstanding there with what the CEO position is about. I think it's fundamentally like, don't run out of money and sell stuff, like sell stuff to customers, sell stuff to new recruits on your team, sell stuff to internally to get stuff done. Like, you're selling nonstop. Um, and I think especially externally, there's like an ickiness factor that, you know, a lot of people talk about when it comes to the idea of sales. But I just think it's a it's it's the totally wrong mindset. I mean, mm -hmm. no matter how much you fancy yourself, uh, you know, a sophisticated product or technologist type of individual, um, if you're actually passionate about building technology to solve problems, then you need to be able to speak with lots of customers. You need to be able to empathize with them genuinely. And oh, by the way, the path to building an effective product is the same way that you are effectively able to sell. So I think there's like just a total misnomer about that. So I totally agree around that fundamental stake. And I'll also say that the best CEOs that I've ever worked for sell to this day, even though their companies are you know, 500 people and worth over $100 million or whatever, they're still selling. And it's it's not just because, to your point, they're really good at it. Or to another point you made, that a lot of people in the sales process, now again, like I'm thinking of a couple of them, they're much more, I think this depends also on the industry and stuff. These are, these are CEOs in sort of high ticket sales items. So it also, like fundamentally, they think of it from that perspective. But like, you're right, when they come to a room to a sales call, changes the immediate tone of like, how serious is this company about winning my business? Mm. And especially like, what are your advantages as a startup founder? Like, like it really boils down to this. If it's like my company 
versus someone else's company. And we've gotten to that point of like, they're going to go with Zal or one of our competitors in the marketplace. What are our strengths? Well, it's certainly not going to be the strengths of the other provider, which is going to be white papers, proof points, you know, X, Y, Z of like all the times they've done this before and the system that they've created around it and how they feel really confident in the results. What am I going to be selling against? The fact that I'm in the room, that every single resource of this company and my reputation, as well as the reputation of my company, is going to be on the line to making sure that you look like a rock star by hiring us as a vendor. Like, that is yeah. my value prop. That's the key thing. You know, I, I always think that, that you know, for young people in a customer-facing role, like in a sales role, uh, they, they seem ashamed of the fact they're young. You know, right. I've got 20 years experience. You haven't got any experience. Yeah, well, that's the positive. That's not a negative. Because... Right. You're going to be, uh, Kayvon, you're going to be my first client. So I'm just going to work exponentially harder for you than anyone else will because you're my first client. And yeah. and to say, here's a list of my successful clients. It's like me saying, you should marry me because here's a list of all of my ex-wives. It's like it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense really because you're trying to convince people that you are going to give them a disproportionate amount of thought. And actually, a lot of the way we set this up, all of the parallels we have in in our lives are parallels that undermine that that thing that we're trying to present to people. So, yeah, ab absolutely. You know, the, I'm going to buy from your company because you're the founder and you came to the pitch. Right. And there's a you know, there's a Paul Graham thing on this and Brian Chesky, the uh, CEO of Airbnb, talks about this a lot. But when they were in the early days of building their company, I think it was Paul Graham that sat down with them and said, look, you don't want a million customers that like you. You want a hundred customers that love you. Love you, yeah. And the whole idea is that, well, those hundred customers that love you, like from the beginning of time, like this is how you build that virality and people talking about your business. And you can actually start thinking about how to really scale is word of mouth is so powerful. Um, and I think it's another really common issue that founders, I think, deal with is you think about, okay, how am I going to create value? But how does that value scale? The, the thing is, those are two different problems, like the whole zero to one, one to infinity thing. So like as founders, as people on the ground floor, like you should be doing lots of things that don't scale, that are on the spectrum of scalability and value, heavily weighing value. Like the whole point is like, I should be giving a disproportionate amount of value because I am the unproven contender in the room and I am going to put all this stuff extra into the basket of making sure that it goes well. And you build the credibility and reputation of someone who does that. And then you start to think, okay, what are the things that I'm getting, a, giving a lot of extra time on that are not scalable right now that I can start prioritizing and thinking, okay, look, I'm doing like five things. The top three are the only ones that actually people are really loving. The, the last two takes a bunch of time, but, People don't even really care about that. How can I scale those things? Now let me go talk to my co-founder, who's a technologist, and say, hey, like, if we were now going from 100 to 1,000, right, like, the whole, you know, how would we be able to do that en masse? But, like, I think that's, like, and that's another thing is, like, people are so focused on, like, what am I going to do when I'm super successful and I need to scale this? It's like, well, why don't we just start with <laughs> what are you going to do <laughs> to, you know, like, get the left foot in front of the right foot. Like, so anyways, I, I'm, I'm only so passionate about this because I'm, this is giving me a, a forum to self-reflect on all the mistakes that I'm making every single day when it comes to these types of, uh, these things. And, 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 you know, one of the things that I love about these sessions that we do is that, that they are, they're online therapy sessions for all of us. You know, <laughs> we're, 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 we're on that kind of metaphorical couch aren't we talking about our problems and clarifying those problems and i think that one of the really interesting things is that um the learning process what is it they say a, a, a wise man looks at someone else's mistakes a normal man looks at their own mistakes a fool keeps making the same mistakes and you know most of us are in the normal stroke fool category most of the time you know we keep doing these repeating things and whether you're 
whether the conversation means that you say the words that make the difference or someone else says the words that makes the difference, it doesn't matter. But we need to move into that wise man category. You know, I need to watch you fall over and say, it's slippery. I need to be careful how I tread there rather than you falling over and then me falling over and going, oh, oh you just did that. You know, actually, there's no lesson in that, is there? Yeah, no, that's well said. Agreed. Mm. Okay, but we're out of time, if you can believe it. Wow, that that this, really ran fast. It really <laughs> does. That was fantastic. How can people learn more about you, your organization? How can they get in touch? Yeah, so uh, check out uh, our website, zal.ai, Z-A-L dot A-I, um, uh, to learn more about the company and sort of what we're up to. We just launched a new uh, newsletter series called Workforce Evolved. Really, really interesting conversations with a lot of the foremost experts in learning science, generative AI, workforce development coming together, providing interesting opinions on the space and sort of what we're doing. And um, otherwise, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, yeah, would love to connect with anyone who's sort of passionate about some of these ideas. So, Fantastic. Cool. And speaking of newsletters, uh, we now have a newsletter. You can nice. uh, get show highlights. You can get beyond the show insights and reminders of upcoming episodes. Scan the QR code on screen or join us at salestv.live forward slash newsletter. This has been another edition of Sales TV Live. On behalf of the panelists and everyone at Sales TV Live, to our guests and to our audience, Thank you for being an active part of today's show, and we'll see you next time. Bye, all.